So let's say you've estimated the cash flows for a business. You put closure on those cash flows, you've attached a discount rate, and you value the business. You think you're pretty much done, right? Well, wrong. In this session, I hope to talk about how you get from that number to the value of the equity in the business, which is the number you might care about if you're an investor. To get from the value of a business that you get by estimating, estimating the cash flows and discounting them to the value of equity, there are four additional steps you need to take. First, you have to decide what you're going to do about the cash you have on your balance sheet. It should be simple, right? Just add the numbers on, but that's not always the case. Second, if you're a company with cross holdings in other businesses, you own 5% of company A or 10% of company B, you've got to bring those ingredients into your value. Third step, if you have any other assets that are value that you haven't counted yet, this is your last chance to count them. And the last step in the process is we owe money. If you have debt outstanding, you've got to subtract out debt. In this session, I hope to look at each of those four pieces and talk about how best to estimate them. So now we have the tools to value just about any business, right? We estimate the cash flows. We come up with a discount rate, reflecting the risk in those cash flows. We attach a growth rate, and then we put closure with the terminal value. We discount the cash flows back. We should be done. Well, not quite. Because in a sense, there are a few loose ends to think about before you come up with the value of equity in this company. Because you value the business, you need to get to the value of equity. And there are four adjustments I'd like to talk about in this session. I want to first start, start talking about what to do about cash and marketable securities that almost every company has on its balance sheet. How much can it be? Well, in a case of companies like Apple, it could be $100 billion. So it's not penny change. What do we do about cash and marketable securities? Second, I want to talk about cross holdings, cross holdings in other companies, minority holdings, 5%, 6%, 8%, 10%, and majority holdings. What if you own 60% of another company? Third, I want to talk about other assets that you might not have counted yet. This is your last chance to sweep them into your valuation. And finally, I want to talk about what debt I should be subtracting out to get to value of equity. So cash, cross holdings, other assets, and debt. Let's start with cash. To understand how cash affects valuation, let me take a very simple case of three companies that look exactly the same in terms of the value of the business you've come up with. So these are values you got by discounting cash flows at the cost of capital. They all have billion dollar values. They all have exactly the same cash balances, $100 million. So there's no doubt about how much cash they have. But here's where the three companies differ. The first company has a return on capital, historically, almost exactly equal to its cost of capital. And it's a developed market company. The second company, historically, has had a return on capital of 5%, well below its cost of capital, and it's also a developed market company. The third company is a company that has generated well above its cost of capital, and it's an emerging market company. All three companies have 100 million, right? Now, I actually think that when you value these companies, in one of these companies, cash is a neutral asset. In other words, 100 million in cash is worth 100 million. In one of these companies, cash is going to be discounted by investors. It's going to be valued less than 100 million. And in the third company, cash might actually trade at a premium. Let's step back. Think about it. Of these three companies, in which company is cash most likely to be a neutral asset? I think it's going to be company A, and here's why. Company A is what I call a blah company. What's a blah company? It does no good. It does no bad. It pretty much runs in place. Not a great company to invest in, but not a bad company either. There you're saying cash doesn't hurt me, doesn't help me. Cash is worth exactly what I see. That's good. That's our conventional practice. Company where I'm most likely to discount the cash? I think company B, and here's why. It has a bad track record, right? It's not the cash itself that worries you. It's what the managers of this company will do with the cash. I call it a stupidity discount. There are some managers I don't trust with my cash for good reason. And here's the way I'm going to deal with it. If they accumulate cash, I'm going to discount the cash, not because the cash by itself is a bad asset, because I'm convinced these managers will find a way to waste that cash. And in the emerging market company, I might actually attach a premium for two reasons. One is, the company does pretty well with my cash, right? Historically, it's earned a pretty good return on capital. The other is, in an emerging market, capital markets often shut down. And if they shut down, having that cash might allow this company not only to survive the downturn, but actually use it as a strategic weapon to buy assets for less than what they're worth. 
So what I'm trying to say is, if you're asked, is cash good or bad? The answer is, it depends. It depends on the company. To show you that I'm not being outlandish in these assumptions, let me show you the results of a study that was done about a decade ago. This looked at the value of cash in the hands of U.S. companies, at least as the market saw it. So what it did was, it looked at thousands of U.S. companies, and it looked at how much the market valued a dollar in cash in the hands of these companies. First, the good news. Across all U.S. companies, a dollar in cash is valued at roughly a dollar. That's good news because that's what we tend to do in valuation is take the cash balance and add it on. But here's the bad news. When this study looked at mature companies that earned below their cost of capital, companies like Company B, a dollar in cash was valued at 69 cents. Think about it. You have a mature company with a bad track record that has $10 billion of cash. The market is going to discount that cash 31% and valued at $6.9 billion. If you were giving value enhancement advice to this company, it'd be very simple, right? Give the cash back. They'll come up with 100 excuses why they shouldn't, but it's good advice nevertheless. And when they looked at young growth companies, so these are companies that face capital constraints probably, a dollar in cash is valued at $1.22. So just because a company has a big cash balance doesn't mean its value will go up when that cash is returned. It really depends on the company. Second stop in the process, cross holdings. Cross holdings are what I call the black hole of valuation. It's the thing I most detest in valuation is valuing companies with lots of cross holdings. And here's why. The accounting for cross holdings is all over the place. At least in U.S. accounting, there are three ways a cross holding can be accounted for. If you own a small piece of a company, 3%, 5%, and take absolutely no role in how that company is run, the holding can be classified as a minority passive investment. If you have a minority passive investment, here's what you have to show in your income statement, the dividends you receive from those cross holdings, and here's what you have to show on your balance sheet, what you originally invested to get that cross holding. Think about it. If you invest in a young growth company 10 years ago, let's say 20 million, that young growth company is now worth a lot. $100 billion. In your income statement, I might see nothing because that company still doesn't pay a dividend. And in your balance sheet, I might see the $20 million you invested 10 years ago. That doesn't help me very much. That's minority of passive investments. Here's the second step up the ladder. Let's say you own 5, 10, 15% of a company, take some role in how the company's run. Then you have to use what's called the equity approach. What's the equity approach? In your income statement, you have to show 15, 20% of the net income or net loss of that company, but below the operating income line. And in your balance sheet, you have to update your original investment for the portion of retained earnings you've accumulated since. So in other words, it's like an updated book value. A little better than minority passive investment, but not quite there. And if you own 55, 60% of a company, you're required in most accounting standards to consolidate, which effectively means you got to act like you own 100% of the company. All the way through, in your income statement, you have to show 100% of revenues and 100% of operating income. In the balance sheet, you have to record 100% of the subsidiary's assets. But here's how you show the fact that you don't own 40 or 45% of the company. The item that shows up is minority interest. It shows up on the liability side of the balance sheet. It reflects what the accountant thinks the 45% that doesn't belong to the subsidiary is worth. It's a book value. Now you see why it's so difficult to value cross holdings. First step is you've got to figure out how the accountants have dealt with these cross holdings. In a perfect world, here's how I'd value cross holdings. I'd value the parent company standing alone. And then I'd value each cross holding separately. I don't care whether you own 5%, 10%, or 65%. And I'd take the percentage of each subsidiary that belongs to you. The advantage of doing it is I can have different characteristics for each company. Different cost of capital, different growth rates, different risk profiles, which I think is appropriate. So in a perfect world, this is how I'd value companies. But in this world, I need full financial statements for every subsidiary, and I have a parent company financial separated from the consolidated financial. In the world that we live in, that's often not the case. We're not given the information on subsidiaries to do this full-fledged valuation. We're given pieces and bits. And especially if the subsidiary is a private business, you might have very little to go on. So here are two options you might use to at least get an approximation. If you have a cross holding in a publicly traded company, you can always cheat and use the market value of that holding. It's cheating because in intrinsic valuation, we are assuming the market make mis makes mistakes. 
but this might be your best choice if you have no other information. If your holding is in a private business and you have the book value of the holding, you can apply a price to book ratio. Based on what? Based on what publicly traded companies in that business trade at. So if I have cross holding in a chemical company and it's a private company and a typical chemical company trades at one and a half times book value, I might multiply the book value by 1.5 to get my estimated value for the cross holding. I'm not happy with doing that. I'd rather do an intrinsic valuation, but without the information, this might be the best you can do. So you've dealt with cash, you've dealt with cross holdings. Third step in the process, look around. Are there any other assets you want to bring into the mix? And let me separate the assets you should try to bring in from the assets you should not. You don't want to double count assets. Any asset that is generating cash flows should not be counted. So if you have a factory that has a physical value, a real estate value, you should not be adding the factory to the present value of the cash flows you get from operating the factory. If you have a headquarters building, you shouldn't be adding the value of the real estate, uh, that, the real estate in that, that headquarters building to the value of your cash flows. That would be double counting. So what you're looking for are truly unutilized assets that have value, but you haven't counted in your cash flows. Those are rare, but they can exist. You might even decide to count things like you know, overfunded pension obligations. Overfunded in what sense? You have more assets than you owe. It's a little tricky because you might not be able to claim that overfunding, but you're basically mopping up. So when you mop it, just make sure you don't double count assets, but it's okay to count assets you haven't counted yet in the cash flows. Last step in the process, you're trying to decide what to subtract out, what debt to subtract out to get to equity. Subtract out all the interest-bearing debt and lease commitments you treated as debt to come up with cost of capital. So that's the easy one. But this is also your last chance to mop up for anything else that might trouble you. So if you have a tobacco company as your investment, what might, you, what might worry you? You might be the target of lawsuits, and you might have to worry about what if I lose those lawsuits? You have to take the expected value of those lawsuit losses and subtract them from the value of your equity. Not easy to do, but I don't see a way around it. So this is your last chance to deal with anything else that might concern you. Use the chance. So in summary, after you've discounted the cash flows back at the cost of capital to get to the value of the operating assets, mop up, add the cash and marketable securities, value the cross holdings the best you can. And if you have a company that has minority holdings or majority holdings, see if you can value them correctly. If, you, if not, use one of the approximations I suggested. Add any other assets you haven't counted yet. Don't double count. And subtract out debt, and in this case, define debt expansively, not narrowly as we did with the cost of capital. And you should have the value of equity in your business.